the Chinese American Heritage Foundation and the Chinese American Citizen Alliance are excited to host a book talk, The Price of Salmon. Chinese workers were incredibly important as they were the main for labor force for the salmon industry in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest from 1870 to 1930. Sadly, this part of the Chinese pioneer to the building of America is not a common knowledge. We hope this book talk will help us to learn more on this mis missing part in the American history. The authors of this book are the Charles brothers, James and Philip. James Chow is an electrical engineer by profession. He received his bachelor degrees from University of Washington and his master's degrees from Case Western Reserve University. He retired for four years ago. He is currently a member of the Friends of Children with Special Needs Board of Directors and a member of the Chinese Historical and Culture Projects Advisory Board. He and his wife are residents of Fremont, California. Philip Chow is an architect by profession. He has a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from University of Washington and a Master of Architecture degree from University of Illinois. He retired from his profession in 2016. He is currently a member of the Design Review Commission for the city of Pasadena. And he and his wife are residents of Pasadena. Since retirement, the Charles brother have devoted their spare time to the promotion of the history of the Chinese American and the salmon canning industry. They have a website showcasing stories of Chinese workers, contractors, and related historical topics. They published The Price of Salmon, originally by Max Stern, this summer. So now we're going to start to give a brief history of the Chinese and salmon canning industry. And without further ado, we're going to start um, to welcome James first. Go ahead, James. Good evening. Thank you, Esther, for the introduction. Both me and my twin brother, Philip, worked in Alaska canneries. I worked three summers from 1970 to 1972, and he worked two summers. As past cannery workers, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk about the history of Chinese in salmon canning industry. Today's topic is about the book, The Price of Salmon. But in order to appreciate this book, we must understand the role of Chinese in the salmon canning trade. Salmon canning was one of the most important industries in Northwest and Alaska before World War II. For more than 50 years, since the mid 1870s, during each salmon season, thousands of Chinese migrant workers toiled in remote canneries along the West Coast, from Oregon to Washington to Alaska. The Chinese were an indispensable and integral part of the canning industry for nearly seven decades. Yet today, this is a forgotten part of the Chinese American history. This evening, we will approach this subject matter in two parts. First, we will do an overview of the history of Chinese involvement from 1870 to World War II. Then we will focus on the Chinese contract system in the year 1922, as reported in the Max Stern's articles, The Price of Salmon. We must point out that salmon canning is quintessentially an American West industry. By the mid 19th century, a lot Atlantic salmon were depleted because of industrialization, overfishing, and environmental degradation. Consequently, the salmon canning industry existed only on the West Coast. But it is also uniquely American Western and for another reason. The migrant canary workers were not white Europeans, but mostly Asians, especially Chinese. How the Chinese and the salmon canning industry came together is the very subject of our talk today. Now, Philip. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Here is a brief history of Chinese in the West Coast salmon canning industry. Back in the 1880s, some white journalists visited the salmon canneries in the Northwest. 
they were surprised to find out that the Simon Canary crew were entirely Chinese. Indeed, the Chinese had penetrated into the labor market of the Simon Canary industry, but there were two more forces at work, the rise of the Chinese contractors and the establishment of the Chinese contract system. Together, they created a sphere of influence starting from 1880 and ending by the 1930s, all for about 60 to 70 years, both in terms of its duration and its influences. This was unparalleled in any other American industries. We must ask two questions. How did this industry begin? And how did this opportunity fell into the Chinese hands? All early California industries focused on the exploitation of natural resources. It turned out that the Sacramento River was rich with salmon. Two brothers from the East Coast, George and William Hume, come to California and settled in Sacramento. They made their living as fishermen, realizing fresh fish could not be preserved. They come up with the idea of canning salmon. They, bought their friend, they brought their friends Hagu from the state of Maine and formed Hagu, Hume, and Company. This monument by the Sacramento River Bank commemorates the location of the first salmon cannery built in 1864. Here is a sketch of a cannery built on top of a riverboat. Their equipment were crude and their techniques experimental, and they had trouble sealing the cans. The brothers lived in a cabin by the riverbank and struggled to keep their business going. By coincidence, 1864 was the year when the Transcontinental Railroad began construction, starting in Sacramento. It opened up the America West to development and the American nation to a promising future. But within less than three years, the Sacramento River had deteriorated and production suffered. The Hume brothers saw it coming and moved their cannery to Columbia River at the border of Oregon and Washington. And by 1869, they had constructed a second cannery. But 1869 also saw the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad as pictured on the upper right corner. And that, that brought the increase of white population and led to the confrontations with the Chinese migrants, which exploded into anti-Chinese movements and legislations and accumulated in the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Anti-Chinese was the national sentiment of the time. The Indian status of the Chinese was not lifted till 1943. In order to man their second cannery, the Hume brothers took the suggestion of their Chinese cook, Sam, and, helped, and hired 12 Chinese from Portland. It happened 1870 was the year of the 10 year US census and the personal facts of the workers were duly recorded. This is truly amazing. As you can see here, the oldest was a young 40 with a saving of $100. He was perhaps one, an old timer from the gold rush days. The youngest was Abu, only 15 years old. He must be a new arrival. Question must be asked, was the introduction of the Chinese labor into the salmon canning industry an inevitable or an accidental event? It was inevitable in the sense that the white laborers were scarce and Chinese migrants were active in Portland. It was accidental in the sense that the Humes had already dealt with the Chinese fishermen back in Sacramento, and they trusted the Chinese cook Sam to act as their middleman. Hume brothers method of production, fishing and hiring became the model and was much copied by others. Here we see the growth of the Chinese cannery workers from 12 to 5,000 in just 12 years. As more canneries were constructed, the industry took off. The Chinese worker population kept growing before, during, and even after 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. The reason was simple. The canneries could not function without them. 
For economical reasons, the white owners kept their Chinese workers, and most of the countries were located in remote Alaskan locations, and anti-Chinese activities were relatively mild. The growth of the Chinese workers was parallel to the rise of the Chinese contractors. This APA's list of Chinese contractors in the years between 1892 and 1908 identified them mostly as corporations. Those merchants were businessmen who spoke English and were able to negotiate contracts with the white canners. Of course, they were far more interested in their own profit making than the benefits of the workers. In return for their money, they assumed full responsibility of hiring, feeding, and supervising the workers. The white canners found this arrangement most agreeable. This collaboration created the Chinese contract system. As a consequence, the labor market was split right along job categories and along racial lines. Only fish possession jobs were handled by the Chinese contractors. All other job categories were off limit to the Chinese. Here, we have three of the most prominent Chinese contractors at the beginning of the 20th century. While left, we have Lan Sun of San Francisco, famous for his long-term partnership with APA. Next, you have Chi Ji He, based in Portland. He was once a contractor associated with the railroad construction. In years, he constructed the second railroad for his home country. At right is Good Deep of Seattle, a very successful investor in many industries. He was named honorary consul by the Manchu dynasty, seen here in his full official attire. Before the fishing season got started, there were two tasks that must be done, can making and box making. Here we see a wood carving of a can making shop. In the foreground, you have boxes of tin piled on the floor and the workstations, workstations at the back, and the semi-finished cans roll down the ramp into the collection basket. After the fishing season opened, fishes were delivered to the canary by the tenders. Fresh fish arrived by the thousands, and they must be processed on the same day. The first step was to sort the fish by species into different bins. The second step was to clean the fish. Here we see the cleaning table, with Chinese butchers lining both sides. Just look at the size of the fish they had to handle, but the Chinese butchers were quick in their action. In seven to eight strokes, they would remove the head, tail, and fins, and cut open the belly, clean the intestine, and scale the fish. They work at a speed of four to five fish per minute and 10 hours per day. This was the most strenuous job, also the best paid job. This is a wood carving that clearly depicted the process of can making, of, can, of canning salmon, all done manually by the Chinese workers. Starting at the lower left, fishes were cut into section, legs lower right, chunks of fish were stuffed into cans. Behind him, cans were welded and sealed off. Upper right, cans were dipped into hot water, and the leaky cans were repaired at the station below. Upper center, Flats of cans were stacked and sent into the steamer. And at the left, after final processing, they were sent to the warehouse. Here we see the New York Commercial Newspaper dated April 26, 1901, with the headline that reads, the salmon cannery of the North Pacific, of the Pacific Northwest. Below the heading was the caption, location of canneries shown an up-to-date map. Every cannery in each region was listed and shown. Hundreds of cannery had spread all the way from California to the very western tip of Alaska. The industry under another boom. Both in terms of the quantity of cannery or production, Alaska had surpassed the other states and took the lead. In another word, the center of the industry has shifted to Alaska. The growth of Chinese workers started in 1870 and reached its peak by 1910. But this same period also overlaps the second industrial revolution. 
that can be some that can be summarized in four areas: science and technology, mass production, standardization, and industrialization. The salmon canning industry was a mirror of the second industrial revolution. Numerous inventions led to the mechanization of the canneries. Each production step was replaced with newly invented machines and connected with production with, and connected with high-speed conveyor belt to create, to create the modern production lines. As can be seen here, upper left, you have the cutting machine, upper center, filling machine, upper right, soldering machine, and the lower left, soaking tub, and the lower center, the steamer. However, total mechanization and automation were not achieved till World War II. By comparison, 1870 to 1912 were the last year of the Manchu dynasty in China. In terms of modernization, China was lagging way behind America. By 1910, the only manual job not yet replaced by the machines was the Chinese butchers. However, in 1903, a Canadian, Edmund Smith, invented the iron chink, which could match the production of 20 Chinese butchers. His design inspiration came from the hand movements of the Chinese butcher. By 1910, the new machine made much inroad into the canneries and eventually replaced all of the Chinese butchers. This explains why all Chinese workers resisted mechanization and they were the unwilling participants in the American Second Industrial Revolution. Here we can compare a 1908 cannery to the cannery from the 1880s wood carving we saw earlier. Obviously, the cannery building was larger and there were a lot more machines and less workers and a lot more noise. The canneries were able to achieve increased production and efficiency with reduced labor. Productive, productivity reached its peak at World War II. Most of the Chinese workers come from three locations, San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. Here we have a view of the San Francisco Harbor. Chinese workers were loading the ship before departure. They were hauling dry goods and supplies, including live pigs and chicken, to be butchered on special occasions. To the right, you see the three masted bark. They look spectacular on the ocean. However, by 1910, the bark was already obsolete, replaced by steel and steam. But the canning company bought them at bargain prices and used them as cargo ships. The Chinese gang lived below the deck and were miserable. We're going to hear their story later. Here we see the bark anchored at the dock by the cannery. Once arrived, it, they, it would wait till the end of the season and return to San Francisco loaded with canned salmon. The Chinese gang came as a group and left as a group. No individual was allowed to quit his canary job halfway or break his Chinese contract. They worked hard for meager wages without much benefits and protection. No wonder they were compared to coolies and slaves. The upper left picture, we see white fishermen at work. They drop fishing net vertically over a large area and use drawstrings to collect the catch. Right upper shows the transfer of fish from small fishing boats to the tender. Lower right, the tender arrives at the pier and is unloading a fish. The lower left shows Indian fishermen being towed out to sea. The Alaskan natives fared much better than their counterparts on the mainland. However, they lost their land, their sea, their fishing rights, but the federal government offered them some limited protection. Our country must provide jobs to Alaskan natives. Here we have a real picture of Chinese workers and the white office, uh, white company officials. They must be fishers from the states and still wear suits and ties. Some Chinese wore traditional Chinese dresses and had pigtails. They did not cut their pigtails until 1912, when the Manchu dynasty was overthrown by the Chinese Republic. This picture shows Chinese workers loitering on the deck. They look like a middle-aged man. They might have worked as canary hands for years, 
Most of them were single, did not speak much English, and did not interact much with the white Americans. They had to tolerate any discrimination from the white majority. Mostly, they lived a truncated life inside Chinatown. They had not left us with any written documents, very little written documents. From this table, we can see the rise and fall of the Chinese workers from 1870 to World War II. There are two peaks. The first occurred in 1882 with the growth of Columbia River canneries. The second happened in 1910 with the growth of the Alaskan canneries. After, after 1910, the population of Chinese workers fell into sharp decline. The Chinese were aging and they have been, they, they were being squeezed by newcomers, including the Japanese, Mexicans, Filipinos, and Blacks. The years between 1910 and the 1930s, the composition of the Chinese gang became complicated. While the Chinese contract was still in control, the workers were much more difficult to manage. Discrimination, exploitation, profiteering, and mistreatment of canary crew by many Chinese contractors brought lawsuits, unwanted publicity, governmental scrutiny, not to mention union labor activities. About the same time, APA moved their headquarters from San Francisco to Seattle, which hit the Chinese particularly hard. In 1938, a labor union in Seattle, backed mostly by Filipinos, won over competitions and the right to, for collective bargaining. That's the point marked the collapse of the Chinese contract system. The Chinese contractors soon disappeared in a matter of few years. In 1938, the year the union was formed, only 367 Chinese workers were sent to Alaska. That number dropped to 20 by 1952. We can therefore conclude by saying that 1938 was the year when the Chinese retracted a mass from the salmon canning industry. As time went by, its most colorful and unusual chapter of the Chinese involvement in the salmon canning industry was lost and forgotten. Back Thank you, me. Philip. He just presented a brief history of Chinese in the salmon canning industry. And that's a lot of information. Uh, with that as the background, now we will take a deep dive into the book, The Price of Salmon and the Underworld of the Salmon Canning Trade. Even today, Stern's articles we meant to be one of the few personal historical accounts of the Chinese scan, Chinese contractors, and the Chinese contract system. Philip? This book, The Price of Salmon, is a reprint of the 37 articles first published by Max Turn on San Francisco Daily News in 1922. The 1910s and the 1920s were a turbulent period of time. The Chinese workers were dropping out of the labor force, replaced by Filipinos, Japanese, Mexicans, and Blacks. The Chinese contractors were losing ground and losing control of their workers. Even the Chinese contract system itself was being challenged in public. In short, things were falling apart. Stern recorded those extraordinary events in his expose of the West Coast salmon canning industry. I will introduce a few key players in the book. First is Max Turn himself, San Francisco Daily News reporter, a UC Berkeley graduate. He was then 36 years old. He wrote in first person. Then is APA, Alaska Packers Association, the largest canner based in San Francisco. Then there was a Chinese contractor. His name was unknown. The Chinese contractor sent a representative who kept an eye on the Chinese scan, and he was referred to as the China man in the book. Mayor and Yang was the, a major player. He was a closing outfitter, but acted more like an employment agency. The Chinese contractors could not recruit, recruit enough Chinese to meet their quota, so they relied on Mayor and Yang to hire the Lin Chinese. Finally, this Charlie, the only Chinese 
named by Stern in his articles, he was the Chinese cook, Jim. Okay, here are a few maps to give you an idea where the story took place. The first part of the book took place in San Francisco. You can see the Chinatown where Chinese contractors and workers were located. And there's a North Beach or Little Italy where many Italian fishermen lived. Then there's the clothing store, Mayo and Young, just north of the Chinatown. Uh, to the upper right, you can see Pier 29, where Stern boarded his ship, Emily Whitley. Here's a map of the entire city. Stern and his shipmates were kept on the ship like prisoners for three days at Pier 29. On the fourth day, a tugboat towed their ship out to sea. They passed the Golden Gate Strait, the Cliff House, and the Farallon Island before the bark set sail. This map shows the Stern's journey to and from Alaska. As shown in the blue line, they sailed from San Francisco halfway across the Pacific before reaching the Bering Sea. It took them 33 days to arrive at his designation, the Wood River Cannery. Two months later, on his return ship, on his return trip, as shown in the red line, Stern boarded the mail ship and visited many other canneries on his way back to Seattle. Pictured here is a photo of downtown San Francisco in 1915. By then, San Francisco was already a financial center of the West Coast, representing the apex of American civilization and home to many salmon canning companies, Chinese contractors, and workers. Yet for years, there were rumors of cannery workers being mistreated by Chinese contractors and horror stories aboard the cannery ships. In fact, those ships were known as the hail ships. In order to get the inside story of the salmon canning trade, San Francisco newspaper, the Daily News, assigned a reporter, Max Stern, as an undercover to sign up with a Chinese contractor and sail to Alaska. So Stern's job was to dig up the dirt inside the salmon canning trade. Now let's all get on board and join Stern and see what he uncovered. In order to disguise his true identity, and uh, Stern dressed himself like a bum. He rented a cheap lodge and he even changed his name. Stern was directed to a particular Jewish clothing store in Chinatown. Back then, it was an anti-Chinese era, filled with prejudice and racism against the Chinese. Under Stern's views, certainly reflected that. Here's a picture of San Francisco Chinatown. This is, and this is how Stern described it. Stern wrote, you gaze into the stores stacked stocked with the queer oriental herbs, restaurants with ornate balconies and the pagoda crested eaves and dark basement steps leading heaven knows where. And under it, over it, and through it swarms like bees in hive, the slant-eyed rays of the rising sun, quiet and inscutable, but decidedly busy with its own affairs. Here's a photo of the clothing store located on Grant Avenue, just north of Chinatown. If you go there today, you can probably still recognize this building. Stern wrote, in front of the Alice in Wonderland store of Marion Young stood a big crowd of men. As I come closer, I scanned a group for one of my own race. There wasn't an American in the crowd. Most were Mexicans. Stern found out that this strange store had no display. Its shelves were empty, and there's only one clerk who could hardly speak English, but he was doing a brisk business. Stern met the two white owners, male and young, and asked about the canary work. And he was told no whites this year, and that he should go to APA office. For several days, 
Stern tried the APA office and other companies without success. Discouraged, Stern returned to Chinatown and mingled with the crowd in front of Mayor and Young's store. Here's a photo of the scene in front of the Mayor and Young store. You may wonder whose head is in the middle of the photo. That's Max Stern, who had his own headshot superimposed. There in front of the store, Stern spotted and befriended an old feeble white man who after a few drinks told him the secret of getting a job. Stern wrote, so this was the secret. Man bought their way to Alaska jobs by ordering suits and outfits from Mayor and Young, subcontractors. I was determined to try by my way, perhaps in the end of the handicap being an American and a white man. I could under with the same key. A few days later, after spending $62.75 at Mayo and Young, Sir bought himself a canary job, which paid him $170 for the entire season. Stern was not aware of the fact that Mayo and Young was actually a subcontractor of Chinese contractors. So this is what actually happened. Stern, a white man, he was booked as a Mexican by a Jewish clothing outfitter to work in Alaska cannery for a Chinese contractor. A few days later, Stern reported to duty on Pier 29 and saw his ship for the first time. Even though wind jammers were outdated, cannery owners still found them useful as a cheap transport ships. Here's a photo of the ship Emily F. Whitley a wooden clipper built in 1880. In its glory days, it was used in trade between Boston and San Francisco. It was later sold to Alaska Salmon Company, which also owned the cannery that Stern was sent to. Stern wrote, she was one of the, a great fleet of superannuated windbaggers, which had been driven from the byways of the sea by steel and steam, unfit for any other trade. They are sent into the boneyard of the Oakland estuaries. Here they lie during the winter months. In the spring, they are hauled forth, given a going over, and sent up to the Alaskan fisheries. There, Stern joined the Chinese gang. On the main deck, we all lined up to sign a contract and receive $10 advance money from a tall Chinese boss. The Chinese gang lived in a cargo hold below the deck what Stern called the China Hole. The dark space was crowded with four rows of bunks stacked three high with very narrow passageways. Here's a photo I took on the ship Starve of Alaska. And that is what a China Hole or China Tongue on a cannery ship looks like. This is definitely not a first class suite on a cruise ship. To begin with, there was no electricity no light and no ventilation. Stern wrote, the worst of all was the marijuana weed, the Chinese tobacco, and the still overused air. The fatigued stink of sweating unwashed humans arose from every group and permeated the furthest corner of the China hole. Stern tried to stay on the deck for fresh air as long as he could. But when he eventually went down, he was surprised to find out everybody gambling by the candlelights. The Mexican boss was head of the blackjack table. The Chinese were playing Chuck Luck and the Blacks, the game of African golf. Bottles of wine were being passed around and the gaming continued until daybreak. Before the night was over, many had lost their $10 advance money. It looks like gambling and booths were the two main attractions on hail ships. On the third day, the white crew arrived, all 100 strong. There were 52 fishermen, equally divided between Latins and Scandinavians. The rest of the crew were mechanics, or what's term called the monkey wrench gang, and the longshoremen or what Stern called the beach gang. Notice that for the white crew, besides the fishermen, we have two groups of gangs, 
the monkey wrench can, and the beach can. They all look down on the Chinese can. In comparison, the Chinese can had 72 men, including mostly Latinos, Asians, Blacks, and other minorities, and among them, only 15 Chinese. In the late 19th century, Chinese scan used to be all Chinese. This shows the effect of 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act and 1892 Geary Act. By early 20th century, Chinese laborers were depleting in number and aging. Stern wrote, my shipmates of the Chile gang were indeed a motley crew. The thing that impressed me about everything was the general lack of fatality among them. They were assured the society keeps for its casual jobs in half its time and then forgets about during the long winter months. Yet Stern found the Chinese to be the most weak and unfit of them all. Stern wrote, they spend their days and nights in a hold gambling, chattering together, drinking tea and smoking their water pipes. Stern attempted to make friends, but was not very successful with the Chinese, except the cook Charlie, and for a good reason. Stern wrote, he was most thoughtful. Just when the game was desperate for food, Charlie always showed up with his hot steaming mince pie, yelling one pie 40 cents. You remember the clothing that uh, Stern ordered at the Mel and Young store? In the afternoon, the clothing arrived. Here's the photo of Stern holding his mattress. It was lumpy and made of the cheapest material. And he was also missing the woolen socks, heavy pants, and jacket he had ordered. In short, Stern and the rest of the gang had all been cheated. Later, Stern thought there was more than one way that the mayor needed to profit of the Chinese gang. Aside from the outfit and $5 commission per head, they also profited by supplying the store on a ship and operating a boarding house in San Francisco. What do you expect? In the wide, wide west, it was a capitalist world. The labor laws were weak and there was low union and each worker had to fend off for himself. The food they were served was almost inedible because Chinese contractors were trying to save money and Song became a source of constant complaint. Here's a photo of the Chinese scan having a meal on the deck on a windjammer. Notice the pots, pans, and washed up the containers of their food. Stern wrote, we were given hunks of bread. It is palatable, a bit full of black spots. The meat was the toughest meat that is at April compacted. After several van attempts to penetrate it, I flung it overboard to the seagulls. The coffee tasted like no coffee I ever met. I washed out my plate with the warm fruit called coffee, dried it with the remaining crust of the bread, and tucked my plate and cup into my bunk downstairs. The dinner was over. I was still hungry, but I could not have eaten a bit more of that handout. For three days, they were held on the ship like prisoners. The ship sailed sail on the fourth day and Stern settled down, he got to know more about his shipmates. One black was once wealthy by smuggling Chinese across the Mexican border. Another Latino was one time chief of police in Panama City. And a boy was bailed out of jail by Mel and Young after he promised to join the gang. Stern wrote, a strange assortment of humans, it will be hard to gather together in one ship, yet, they had all been reduced to a sort of working equality by misfortune. Food was horrible, but even worse, water was rationed. At times, they were given only one cup of water a day for drinking and washing. Just imagine not being able to take a shower in 30 days. Stern wrote, those migrant workers had been classed as the great unwashed. From what I saw, they are as clean by instinct as any of the so-called upper classes. But Stern was in a most awkward position. He was one of the few white men in the Chinese gang. One day he tried to join a few fishermen playing cards on the deck, 
but the captain caught him and said, you don't belong here. At that moment, Stern realized that there was a cast system on the ship with the captain at the top, followed by the monkey wrench gang, the beach gang, the fisherman, and at the bottom, the Chinese gang. This class structure was further complicated by race and the nationality. It was definitely not a melting pot. Look at this photo. Under full sail, the windjammer looks majestic, but their journey was treacherous and unlike today's Alaska cruise, the bark had to face all kinds of weather conditions in their month long journey. There were days of stiff headwind and they had to tack and make little progress. Then there were stormy days when it was so rough that even the Chinese gang quit gambling. But there was something more than just the weather. Stern wrote, the waters over which we were passing are considered dangerous to the battle mariner. We had come ashore the open seas for 1600 miles and pulled up opposite the little gate, 10 miles across, called the Unimac Pass. Guarded by the great pig, Moses and his brother, Rocky Jack, it was a feat of navigation. This is what they saw as they approached the Unimac Pass. The tall peak on the left is the Shishanda Volcano, or what Stern called Moses, and to its right, is the Sanoski volcano, or what was locally known as Ragley Jack. The Chinese gang were all jubilated to see the land. Stern wrote, Tierra shouted the Mexicans tumbling up the slippery stair to the deck. Ba Viva la Terra. Here on top is a photo of the cannery ships gathered near the pass, waiting for the right conditions. Stern wrote, Finally, one evening, Captain Joe sent her sliding past the lighthouse at Scotch Cap and into the pass. A fair wind caught our sails and pushed us through a driving run over the rough waters of the Bering Sea. As we passed through the gap, the fog had cleared and Moses stood majestically in his 14,000 feet for all of the world, like the picture of Fujiyama. Finally, after 33 days, they arrived at the Wood River Cannery, which was probably the worst cannery in Bristol Bay. Their hope for better living conditions were so dashed. Just take a look. The large building in the back is the cannery. The building in the middle is a bunkhouse. And in the front are the shacks. The Chinese can live in the bunkhouse in the center and also in the shacks at the foreground. Stern Road. The cannery was built on top of a piles in the midst of a sort of swamp. A sea of mud, tin cans, and refuse surrounded the herded group of buildings, which together gave forth a picture of nothing so much as a rag picker's village. The bunks were some eight feet square, but the roofs on them were too low to permit the occupant to stand up. Of course, there were plenty of work to do. Every morning, they were awakened by Charlie, the Chinese cook, at 5.15 a.m. sharp. Stern wrote, we had arrived a good month before the great annual drama of the Northwest, the salmon run. Our first job was to unload the lighters and carry the Chinese provisions to the chink store. It was heavy backbreaking job at times, lifting boxes of bacon, canned goods, sacks of potato and beans. Their next job was making boxes. Stern soon learned that the Alaskan natives received special treatment and the Chinese were protected by the Chinese contractors. No wonder Stern felt discriminated against. Stern wrote, I walk alongside a couple of young Shiwash braves for several days. They were each being paid $3 a day and board and they ate at the fisherman's mess. I was getting a little bit more than one dollar a day, and I ate the, at the Chinaman's mess. The same thing was true of the Chinaman. Years of inaction, tea drinking, and opium smoking had weakened the best of them. They were no good for heavy work. Just as the Chinese workers were getting three hundred fifty dollars to six hundred dollars a season, compared to our one hundred and seventy dollars, 
so they were given more for box making. There was no heating inside the bunkhouse, but each shack had a stove. Often stern and the Chinese guy would gather inside the shack in the evening to keep warm and amuse themselves. Stern even formed a quartet with uh, three blacks. Stern wrote, one of our favorite means of entertainment was singing. Three colored boys and I made up a quartet, and each night we would go through a long repertoire in one of the smoky huts, packed tight with men of many nations and many colors. It's interesting that Stern bonded with the blacks, but noticeably absent were the Chinese. The Chinese lived by themselves in the real part of the bunkhouse, and they ate alone. I wonder if they were segregated by others, or if the Chinese choose to segregate themselves from the rest of the gang. Maybe it was both. After two months, Stern had seen enough of this country. So he decided to get away and visit other countries, but he couldn't just leave. He had to break his Chinese contract, something that has never done before. One day he was summoned to, miss, to meet his Chinese boss, and it all came down to dollars and cents. Stern wrote, he finally agreed. You pay me all you owe me and mayor, and I let you go. He got out his ink brush and started figuring. I, it was a tense moment for me. It had been just two months. I was being paid at the rate of $34 a month. I owed Mayor $62.50 for my outfit. The Chinaman would collect $5 for school tax. I had been advanced $10 by the Chinaman, and I had spent $5.30 in the stores. That made a total of $82.50 I owed the Chinaman and the mayor. Subtracting $68 from $82.80, I found that I owe him $14.80, for which he forthwith presented a bill. Well, I say to myself, it's a good thing that I'm quitting now. If after working two months, a fellow owe his boss $14.80, how much will he owe him at the end of five months? So Stern finally got his release from the Chinese boss. So he learned a mail ship was due to arrive in, at Clark's Point in 10 days, 10 miles down river. But he had no way to get there. He was a fisherman Tom who came to his rescue. Stern worked at the Clark's Point cannery for over a week before getting a mail ship and he was free. Stern investigated many ca seven canneries along the way before arriving in Seattle. Here's a photo of Stern after landing in San Francisco. Stern left on April 15th and returned home at the beginning of September. The first of his 37 articles appeared in San Francisco Daily on September 24th at 1922 almost exactly 100 years ago this week. Philip, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, yes, I would say The Price of Simon is a multifaceted book that demands close reading. Stern cuts across a cross section of the American society, reflecting the conflict and cooperation between different races and classes. Stern himself, of course, represents the white elite, looking at the so-called Chinese problem. While he was sympathetic to the plight of the Chinese gang, he did not see much merit in the Chinese as a people, or for that matter, the Chinese civilization. The book almost reads like a high sea adventure, were it not for the fact it was an investigation of the Chinese contract system and an urgent call to abolish it. In short, the price of Simon invites our deeper understanding of what happened then and an interesting comparison with what is happening today. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, concludes our presentation part. Uh, I think we're ready for any Q&A. Yeah, so um, thank you so much, James and Philip, for uh, sharing the history of this Chinese 
and the salmon canning industry and, and your book. And um, yes, if anybody have any question, please feel free to type in the chat box. Uh, but meanwhile, let me start with a few questions that I actually have for James and Philip. So feel free, whichever one wants to answer it. So um, first question, actually I want to combine with my second question is, how did you find out about this Max Stern and his article? And is it because you find these articles, that's why you want to publish this book or you have other reason of why you want to publish this book? Okay, maybe I can just uh, uh, cover the first part of the question. How did we find out about uh, Max Stern and his book? Uh, it, it happened about uh, three years ago when my brother and I, when he came to San Francisco, and we went to visit a ship that called Bakadutha uh, at the San Francisco Maritime National Historic Park. And uh, uh, that ship was at one time a Canary ship. Okay, it was at that time it was named the Star of, of Alaska. Uh, there's uh, uh, at uh, in 1902, that ship was actually chartered by Alaska Packers Association and that ship was uh, shipwrecked. And the Alaska Packers Association bought it for $500 and converted it into a canary ship and renamed it Star of Alaska. So on that ship, we actually saw an exhibit about the history of the uh, this particular ship, and uh, it mentioned Max Stern and his uh, articles. That's how we found out and how we trace it down uh, those articles. Uh, Philip, maybe you can cover why we uh, want to publish it as a book here. Uh, yes, uh, this uh, as uh, we mentioned in the, in the talk that uh, there is there really has been very little lit information literature about that period uh, of the Chinese workers in the salmon canning industry. When you think about it, given the 70 year period and the thousands and the thousands of Chinese who worked in the industry as either workers or contractors, it's amazing there's really very little written documents left. And uh, I'm trying to think about what, what was the reasoning. Uh, there may be a few, for example, there's the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire that probably destroyed quite a few uh, physical doc, uh, uh, documents and uh, uh, properties. Then, this, of course, this, the majority of the Chinese were merchants and workers. They, are not, they were not intellectuals, they were not writers, and they were probably also very limited output or outlet for their for their writings, even they do, you know, maybe there's uh, some newspapers, but I'm not sure there were a lot of for publishers for books. So uh, the documents are are just very scarce, and uh, some of them they come by in uh, in the form of uh, immigration documents, in the form of, of court documents uh, when they get into lawsuits, and definitely there was some. Uh, newspaper information, for example, uh, in terms of the births and deaths of their family members, uh, in terms of uh, lawsuits when they get in or when they form corporations. So those could, could be traced back. But that's what is be becomes so shocking and, uh, and stunning is uh, stern. It is giving us a personal account of what was happening in that period of time. Uh, he, he covered the Chinese contractor, the Chinese worker, the Chinese contract system, the, the white canners, all the other, all the other workers uh, of other nationalities and races. And it, so it, uh, it's uh, just an amazing cross-section of the, of the industry. Uh, and uh, so, so here suddenly we have you know 37 articles <laughs> on this very topic and we find it really very 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 valuable how long do you take you guys to write this book we i, I would say we didn't write it uh, the article were already published in the newspaper and uh, but the problem is that the documents were stored in as uh, flash mail images and uh, so they were, they were very, they are just piece and parts of the newspaper. And a lot of them 
the newspaper was so old and torn that the images are uh, unreadable. So we are really have to piece it all back together and make corrections and edit. We, we are actually working as editors, not as uh, original uh, uh, authors. authors. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Jim, you want to add something? Um, yeah, I think the one of the difficult part is to convert this uh, newspaper facsimiles into documents. Okay, so we basically have to digitize it. And uh, luckily, we, we we have a friend who is familiar with optical scanning, and he was able to cut the newspaper articles into small pieces and scan them part and part, and then later piece them together. But even after that, we spent a month just trying to correct all the typos because there were so many mistakes uh, during the during this translation. And uh, after we finished that part, we still found there's at least a dozen parts or spots where were so were darkened parts so you you just cannot uh, recognize it. So uh, and Philip found out that there's an original newspaper kept at uh, UC Berkeley Library. So over two years ago, we, we found out, uh, we say, okay, let's just go to the library and take a look. Uh, then COVID-19 hit. The library says it's close to outsiders. So we did not get permission to visit library until early this year. And uh, we were able to fill in many of those uh, empty spots. And uh, that's why the book took us more than three years. But uh, I think the lucky thing is, uh, it comes out this year and uh, essentially becomes the centennial ed edition, exactly 100 years after the original publication uh, in 1922. That's wonderful. So there are a few questions. Um, did you guys also travel by ship to Alaska during your summer job in the salmon cannery industry? Uh, if so, how long did it take you? Oh, it took us a long time, uh, probably one day, you know, to fly from Seattle to Bristol Bay, <laughs> uh, essentially by World War II, okay, they stopped the transporting workers to Alaska uh, using the ships. Yeah, so after World War II, everything, yeah, it's, just, it's by air. So so why, uh, why Chinese stopped going to Alaska before World War II? Well, there were several reasons. Okay, one of the reasons was mentioned by Philip that uh, in 1937, 1938, the workers' union pretty much replaced the Chinese contract system. So suddenly the Chinese were found out they, they, they had no representative. And uh, then uh, many of the large companies such as Alaska Packers Association, San Francisco, they moved their headquarters from San Francisco to Seattle. So again, that hurts the Chinese. And the third thing that happened is uh, as the World War II started, hand salmon was considered military goods, military supply. So the government took over. So after the government took over, the government merged all the unions, okay? And instead of having three dispatching centers, Seattle, Portland, and uh, San Francisco, all the three dispatching centers were merged to Seattle. Again, you know, it would be very difficult for the Chinese to travel to Seattle just to wait to be dispatched. That's those, for those reasons, the Chinese just basically were out of uh, the canning industry by World War II. I see. Um, so were any Chinese organization like Tongs uh, serve as labor contractors? Would you have any ideas? I don't think the towns themselves are sponsor are sponsors of the of the uh, of those contracts. But in the very beginning, back back in the early days, maybe in the late nineteenth century, when the Chinese migrants first arrived, they are received by by the town and by the associations, family associations. And they were, they were allowed to settle down uh, and they got some assistant. I'm sure they got some assistant for, uh, for finding jobs and, uh, and getting, getting help. But, not, but uh, a lot of the Chinese contractors 
who are actually res directly responsible for hiring, many of them are in fact members of the town and associations. Okay, so um, it's nine o'clock. Um, so let me wrap up with the last question. Do you have more pictures of the Chinese cannery workers? We have a few more, but a lot, a lot. Okay, we uh, because uh, as uh, we talked earlier, the, the documents on Chinese scan were very, very scarce, and uh, it's really hard to find them. So we do have a few, and you can find them in our website, but uh, not a lot more. Okay, all right. So um, I really want to thank um, James and Philip. I mean, that's a lot of information that you're sharing with us, and we really appreciate you writing the books. So if anybody's interested in it, please go to amazon.com. Um, I believe um, they have the um, ebook and um, also the paper book are available right now. So uh, please go to amazon.com and purchase a book and we can learn more about it. And um, as I said and at, at the beginning, um, sadly, this history is not really shared in American history or not even a lot of people know about it. And we definitely want to share um, with our country that, you know, Chinese not, you know, just World War workers or uh, World War II veterans. We, we serve in different ways, even uh, the salmon workers. And so thank you for um, sharing this um, webinar with us. Uh, we're looking forward, uh, since this is recorded, with your permission, we might want to work with you if we can share with some high schools and share with students um, to learn about this history. So we'll be keep, keep in touch with you. And um, thank you again um, for uh, doing this great presentation with us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everybody for attending.